Man, I don't know what's going on with the phone. Oh, neither. This is ridiculous. Uh, it, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't know what what's going on. I'm on a hard line phone. I am too. Uh, so I won't bother you much longer. Hey, uh, I'm sure Wait you've been. Where did where did I end up at there? Well, you... I don't want to have something end in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. You're... Oh, just about his addictions. Yeah, and and did I say about when they grow up, for them to wait? No. Regard. Okay, I was saying that at this very age, you you just don't know whether you have it. So if you do have it and you start very early, then it's going to hit you very early. Mm -hmm. But you're going to be addicted, and you're going to have a rougher time than if you wait until you're old enough to drink legally before you drink. And if you do have to take pain medicine. If you will take it, and when the pain has gone and there's no reason for you to take it anymore, then don't take it anymore. Don't get any more. If someone offers you one, just refuse it Whether if you don't need it. If they're just mm -hmm. saying this will make you feel good, just say, I don't want to feel good. I feel good the way that I am. I'm okay. And just say no. The same way they tell you to say it to marijuana or anything else. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you prescription drugs do the same thing. I got this in my mom's cabinet. You know, it'll make you feel good. Just say I don't want it, and just don't take it. And I said, and then when you get older, you have a better chance of fighting it off if you do have an addictive nature, when you can reason things out and know I don't want to get into this. Did Elvis try to fight it? He did, and he won short battles with it. He, he didn't win the war, as we know, but mm -hmm. he won some battles with it when he'd get off of it for a while, and mm -hmm. he'd ease back into it. Yeah. He got off of it when we did the satellite show for a month or two while. He looked great. He and I dated. I dieted. He he made me go on another diet with him. Uh huh. That Joe and Lamar and I had been on in Vegas in August and September, and I'd lost something like thirty pounds. And so, when he knew he was going to do the satellite show, uh, there at the end of November or so, he said, "Sonny," because he knew it was a thirty-day diet. You there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 And uh, uh, asked me to go on it with him so he could lose some weight for the satellite show. He was probably about 20 pounds overweight, which would be more so on camera, as you know. Mm -hmm. So I told him I didn't want to go on it again, Joe. God, I hated that diet. I just hated the food that you ate was prepared, frozen stuff in bags that you heat in boiling water for 10 minutes. Had no seasoning. They had a thing called stew. They had a thing called chili that tasted, uh, they tasted just alike. I think they were lying. <laughs> they were the same thing, and they just put two different labels. But you, you're, you could have, now this diet was so particular, mm -hmm. you couldn't even use lotions or anything that had fat in them to rub on your skin. You can No, it would go in to your system and make you gain weight. Huh. That's how weird this thing was. So I told Elvis, Elvis, yeah, you can't do any of that. You can't cheat either. I said, because if you do, man, you'll put on weight faster than you could ever take it off. So anyway, he, uh, after I tried to tell him that it could kill me or damage my organs because I spent wait six months before I went out, I was just making stuff up. Uh -huh. never told me this, but I'm trying to tell him that so I don't have to take it again. And he said, that's not going to happen to you, Sonny. I need you to get on with me. I said, okay. Uh -huh. So I did, and I called Artie Newman in Vegas at the casino boss one of them and he sent 30 days supply out for me and 30 for Elvis and with the prepared food the daily shots that you gave yourself in the in the thigh uh, with that little short disposable needle you know oh my goodness oh yeah you didn't know it's nothing to it it's so short it's only got it goes into your skin there and it's only about got it I don't know probably less than a half inch long mm -hmm. And you just pop it in, and there's just a little stuff in there, and some of it is vitamin B12. Uh -huh. The rest of it is the protein from a pregnant woman's urine, or mm -hmm. a mare, a, a horse, or something. I'm not sure. I heard oh, stories. But anyway, uh, so the, the evening meal was wonderful, Joe. It was filet mignon. Mm -hmm. Two ounces. <laughs> Four, it was cooked. Oh, jeez. It was a bite. Oh, my God. It was literally a bite that I normally took when it was cooked. And so I did. I cut it in half and took a bite, and I just chewed on it until it was gone. I took the other one, the other half, and chewed on it the first night, you know, that I did it. And I thought, wow. And then I realized, I'm done. 
Yeah. My meal is over, man. What is going on? So I learned how to cut it real thin. <laughs> real thin. Razor thin. Yeah. And just kind of let it melt in my mouth. Bite after bite after bite. So uh, we, he got me to do it. And I ordered that stuff, and we did it. And that first night, I said, Elvis, let me tell you something right now. Before you eat that steak, let me show you how to do it. And I started cutting. He said, man, I, I can't. I said, Elvis, if you don't, you're going to take it in a couple, three bites. You're going to be done with dinner, man. Uh -huh. And I said, you need to make it last as long as you can, because you don't get it again until tomorrow night. So he, he did it, and uh, he didn't cut as thin as I did, but he cut it in several little pieces, you know. Uh-huh. And we also, before we started, I, I said, also, Elvis, you can't let the guys be around us when we eat with anything that they're eating. Yeah. Because it'll make you want to cheat. You'll think just a bite of something. But you don't know that bite could put on a pound or a pound and a half. Mm -hmm. So I said, you just can't let them eat around us while we're, while we're doing uh, our thing. And I said, and don't let them kid us and talk about the burger they just had. Mm -hmm. and he said, I won't. So they didn't. So... Some of them would sit there just quietly while we and we'd talk about other things, but most time they stayed out. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they smell like food. And he looked good too. Oh, he did. He looked fantastic. That's the best he's looked in a long time. You know, since uh, well, when I say a long time, he looked good in early '72. Then he started putting on a little weight, and that's why he needed to take it off mm -hmm. by the time we did the satellite show. But he he looked so good between '67 and '71. Yeah. He did. That's when he made Stairway Joe and. And uh, had changed of habit, Charo. Mm -hmm. Were you in any of them, uh, Sonny? Oh, yeah, I was in Stairway Joe. I had a, uh, a kind of a featured role in that. I played a character named Jackson Hecro, a good friend of Ellis's, an Indian friend that grew up with him on the reservation. Oh, I didn't think I realized that was you. <laughs> yeah, that's me with the black hair, and then I wear the Levi coat, Levi, I mean, Levi jacket, and Levi. And he darkened your skin. Huh? They darken, they darken your skin? Make up and they also uh, put a, a dark rinse on my hair to darken it up. Uh -huh. And my name is Jackson Hecro. You can see me. I'm, I'm all the way through it when he first starts. And, do you remember the opening of the picture when he's riding the bull in and everything? Right. Okay, do you remember the uh, the Indian people that were helping herd them as they were got near the place? Right. We pulled up in a flatbed truck. Right. I was on the back, and I jumped off. My girlfriend, I put her on my back, piggyback, and we were herding those oh, cows. See, I did not realize that was you. That was me, yeah. Well, how was it on the, on the, how was it doing the movies? It must have got boring after a while. I'm going to tell you, well, the movies for Elvis were boring because of, he, he referred to them as travelogues starring him. Mm -hmm. You know, because he said, they just take me to another location, give me some songs to sing, a couple of girls and a couple of guys to fight, and that's it, just in different locations. Right. So, and it was true. But that came because of the success, Elvis' success in that movie, uh, Blue Hawaii, was also his, his nemesis that he had to live with, because everyone, including Hal Wallace, wanted the success of that picture. Again, that was Elvis' most successful picture. It cost about a half a million dollars to make, and it took him eight to ten million dollars. So. Uh -huh. In today's figure, that'd be a twenty-five million dollar budget and a three hundred and fifty or three hundred seventy-five million dollar gross. Wow! Taken in, so that you, that's a major hit, right? Yeah. So that's what it was back in there, in, in comparison to what the money was worth. So everybody uh, wanted a blue Hawaiian. Everybody wanted that, including him. They said because his movies uh, made all of his movies made money, Joe. Mm -hmm. And Flaming Star wasn't much singing, and it made money, but not not that much. Uh, Loving You made some money. Uh, Jailhouse Rock made money, and King Creole, they all had those singing, but there was drama involved also. Mm -hmm. So when he made Flaming Star and Wild in the Country with hardly any singing, uh, they didn't make as much money. And then he came out with uh, uh, Follow That Dream. After, well, he came out Blue Hawaii, which was a huge hit, the mm -hmm. ever in his career. And then he came... Uh, Paradise? Yeah, Paradise, Wise Style, and then... Uh, before that, girls, girls, girls. Every couple of years, uh, Al Wallace was hoping to go to Hawaii, that location, and another story, and have the same success as Blue Hawaii, but it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. They made money, but they all made money more than the ones that he didn't sing in. You know, they didn't have a, a lot of hits, I mean, a lot of songs in the soundtrack. So he got to really hate it? Yeah, he got where, well, he didn't hate it because 
he just decided that all of us guys would have a lot of fun making them. Mm -hmm. And we started doing that in 1960 when we went out there and started on GI Blues and uh, then uh, everything. And then when he, when he, see, because <clears throat> what you remember, see, Colonel there again, Colonel was just getting multiple contracts because that was security for Elvis because Elvis was concerned when he left to go in the Army because he heard, he had been hearing that he was a flash in the pan, that he wouldn't last. And everything, and then when he had to go to the army, people said, "Well, there, that's it, right there. That's but when he comes back, it's going to be a whole different thing going on." So mm -hmm. he heard these things, and they concerned him. And uh, sure, it would. Uh, exactly. So when he came back, and the colonel signing, giving him signed a new contract at MGM and Fox, United Artists, uh, that Sam Cashman production out there, he's getting him signed up to a lot of pictures, and Elvis feels the security that hey, he is not a has been. You know, these people wouldn't be signing up for these movies with big money for three or four years uh, in advance like that. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't available to do other movies. He had to live up to his contract. Well, people forget, if they'll look back and look at his first four pictures, how was Colonel or anybody else to know that they were going to get Elvis locked into a system because of one successful movie called Blue Hawaii? He couldn't know that. Right. But Love Me Tender was different. Loving You was different. Jailhouse Rock was different. And King Creole. They had drama and they had music. Except Love Me Tender didn't. That was his first movie. Uh, and it didn't have a whole lot of the title tune and everything. But uh, there wasn't a lot of singing in that. That party thing that he did, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, Loving You was a musical uh, drama. Jailhouse Rock, musical drama. And King Creole, which was really taken from a book, uh, The Rides of Stone for Danny Fisher. Mm -hmm that Paramount actually bought for James Dean. Mm -hmm. They bought the rights for James Dean to star in it, but instead of being growing up to be a singer, he grew up to be a fighter. Right. Elvis, they changed it where he becomes a singer. Mm -hmm. But they both worked the bus boy and this and that in New Orleans, and everything else was pretty much the same. So they hired a great director and a great guy. So my point being, those four pictures are all different, making money, how are you supposed to know that there's going to be a movie come in somewhere in that first uh, movie that you made in one of the first movies in, the, in a year or so after he got out of the Army and started fulfilling those contracts that Colonel got signed up for him? Mm -hmm. How was anyone to know that one of them was going to be so big that everybody kept trying to prove that that's one they wanted to do? They wanted another Blue Hawaii. Yeah. And that's why he got tied into them. And that's why the script were the way they were. They were uh, not great script writers that did them. They weren't. They were uh, all original, so they weren't taken from a great book. Mm -hmm. like King Creole was taken from that stone for Danny Fisher. Some of them were so bad, Sonny. I mean, hear them, scare them, Sonny. I have uh, never been able to sit through that whole show. I know. Hear them, scare them, and uh, Kiss and Cousins. <laughs> Both of them by that Sam Katz when they, they, they were like a 15-day a shooting schedule or something like that. Is that all it took? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was much, much. It was probably half of what a regular picture that he did shoot shooting wise in weeks oh what stinkers i know and and but he got big money he got a half a million dollars for each picture and 50 percent of the gross wow so, and, he, and he made money yeah so that's what i mean so this is why the colonel gets blamed for that but you got to remember too that unless you were a big dramatic star like a marlon brando or paul newman or someone like that that you didn't really usually think that i mean that you just didn't Yet some of them that wanted it weren't big enough, and they maybe got it later in their career, like when Steve McQueen got bigger uh, and became a star. He had script approval and probably director approval and everything else. Mm -hmm. But uh, Elvis and them had so many contracts that they had signed, and none of them had that in there because no one knew what was going to happen. The colonel was very smart, but he wasn't a damn genie. He could right. see something in the future like that going to happen. So that's, that's another thing that I straighten out in my book. So don't blame him for those movies. Right. So how was it? They just said, here's here's your next movie? Huh? Is that, is this, how was it? It was like, here, here's your next movie, and you have no say at all? No, here's the script that they sent for you for the next movie for Paramount. Here's the script that they sent for you. Uh, William Mars Agency would get the scripts, and they would send them to the Colonel, and the Colonel would turn them over to Elvis, say, you know, this is your next movie. Oh. Or GM or United Artists or Fox, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. and, and what would Elvis say about him? He said, yeah, I'll be ready. That was it. He had a very good mind on remembering dialogue. Yeah. 
interviewed at one time and pretty much knew his lines. Wow. Sonny, why were you in uh, Red and uh, Dave and that let go? Well, I've never known the real reason. Really? I'm not sure. In fact, I tried. I wanted Ellis to tell me why. Because Vernon used the word cut back on expenses, but that wasn't it at all. I mean, he paid uh, Ed Parker, he paid uh, Sam Thompson a salary. And so we were replaced by people. Uh, so it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. I've heard that it was the lawsuits. Well, I only had one in 16 and a half years. I only had one lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was taken up for David Stanley, his stepbrother, because a guy was getting ready to beat him up and had drawn back to hit him when I nailed him and knocked him out. <laughs> and he sued. Of course. Up in Tahoe. So they all sued. They know Elvis not going to go to court and everything. So that I'd heard that, and I thought, that doesn't make sense. Red had three or four lawsuits <laughs> there from, from getting into it with some people, but they were... Usually drunk people, they were not the they were not the, the fans that are just saying, Elvis, oh man, hey, you know, they weren't that they were smart ass people. Mm -hmm. uh, they, and I was there at them, uh, every one of them. I was there and broke it up and everything and, and separated them and, and got the person away and out of the out of the way. But so that that didn't hold water with me. Mm -hmm. Then uh, on the uh, I'm talking about me here, right. my situation. On the 4th of July, nine days before I was let go, on the 4th of July, my wife was in California. She hadn't been to Memphis for some time, and I asked Elvis if I could fly her and Brian in. And, of course, I couldn't afford it, but fly him in on uh, his American Express card with American Airlines. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Because I never asked him to fly anything anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we were always flew with him. And he, he, he paid for all of us when we flew with him, but I didn't ask him for separate flights like that. And he said, absolutely. So uh, I'd already asked him that. Well, on the 4th, I'd call her and ask her if she's all ready to come in because the next day is my birthday, July the 5th. Mm -hmm. And she's, uh, her and Brian are flying in. We're going to spend a couple of weeks there. And then they're going back, and then I'm going to fly out and join Colonel on, on the pre-tour a couple of days early to start setting up. The, the next tour. So on the 4th, when I called her and, and I asked her, she, she started crying. She said, I'm not coming. I said, what do you mean you're not coming? What, what's wrong? She said, I just got off the phone with Wally. His name was Wally Jones. He was a supervisor for American Airlines. He's the one we dealt with, all of us dealt with most of the time, Vernon and, and us guys, Joe and us that set up flights. And that's who we dealt with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, what do you mean? She said, I called him to tell him that, that I hadn't received a ticket and everything, and he said that uh, he was sorry, but Vernon had stopped it. And she said, what? He said, yes. He said, you I'm sorry. He said that you and Brian were not on Elvis's expense account. Wow. And, I, and so she says, I'm not, I said, no, 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 no. I said, honey, don't. I'll talk with Elvis. I'm waiting on him to come in here to, to Fort Worth. Uh, when he gets here, I'll talk to him and get this straightened out. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. And so Elvis came in, and I said hi to him, helped him out of the car, got him up, <coughs> excuse me, got him up to his suite, and then said, uh, which we went to his bedroom, I said, Elvis, can I talk to you a minute? And he said, yeah. So he started taking his coat and everything on, and I said, I just got off the phone a little bit ago with Judy, and uh, she, uh, uh, you know, to come to Memphis. She said, yeah. And I said, well, she was upset and crying because uh, she wasn't going to come. And he said, why? I said, well, because she said that, Wally had told her that uh, your dad had uh, said no to a ticket. He said, uh, someone else must have done that, Sonny. I said, well, I said, no. He said that, that your dad said that her and Brian weren't on your expense account and that he wasn't going to okay that. Mm -hmm. he, oh, he said, well, he said, sir, he said uh, I, I, I may have forgot to tell him. He said, we've been kind of taking care of that, daddy's been taking care of that because some of the guys have been abusing that. And he said, I, I know you haven't. And I said, no. Because some of the guys have girlfriends and this and that coming out on tour. So I said, uh, he said, I I'll talk to Daddy. That'll be, it'll be okay. You tell Judy to go ahead and, and get ready and come on on that flight tomorrow because it's, uh, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. said, okay. So I left. I thought, that's fine. I went back and called Judy and told her that Elvis said it was his fault that he had not called his daddy and told him because some guys had been abusing it. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. So I said, that's why. That's what it is. And I said, you know, 
we can't pay any attention to Vernon. He didn't like any of us. <laughs> I said, Elvis loves us. And that's that's exactly what I told her. And she said, okay. So she did. And she was fine. And then about two hours later, Ricky Stanley comes to my door and knocks on the hotel door. And I open it. And he said, hey. I said, hey, Ricky. He came in and he said, what you say to Elvis? What do you mean, what did I say to Elvis? I thought, why is he asking that, right? Mm -hmm. and I said, why? And he said, because, boy, he's ranting and raving, saying you put his daddy down. And and, and, and I said, what? I said, oh, wait a minute. i got to go over and straighten this out. So I went, oh, I, I was going to go. He said, oh, he's out now. Nick gave him a shot. He's, he's asleep. I said, okay. Well, I knew that I would be going to Oklahoma, uh, I mean, to Tulsa, to, uh, for the, because the Elvis was going to come over there. Uh, to do the next show on the fourth there, and then we were going to go home. Oh, this was the third, then I guess. Mm -hmm. No, no, this was the fourth because he was going to do the show that night and come into Memphis and do the uh, the show on the fifth there and close it out at the Coliseum. That was the end of the tour. Mm -hmm. So I uh, thought, well, I'll just talk to him about it when I see him not for a show, but in Memphis and. Uh, when he came over to Tulsa, I reached in to help him out, and he said, yes, hey, boss, and got it out nothing. I thought, well, just let it go. He must have been upset about something else. And then, so that's why I wondered if that was it. Mm -hmm. That had something to do uh, nine days later, eight days later on the 13th. So I didn't bring it up, and then that night on my birthday, after he finished his show in Memphis, it was my birthday, and we get back out to the house. He's going up the stairs. Uh, after the show, and I said, well, good night. He, I said, uh, I'll see you in a few days, because he always would just hang out upstairs and, and everything after the show then for a few days, kind of unwind. And he said, yeah, okay. So oh, happy birthday, Sonny. I said, oh. I said, thanks. I said, by the way, I said, uh, Judy, he loved, all the guys loved her dessert. She made great cakes and apple pie and peach pie. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I said, Judy brought a birthday cake she made all the way from from uh, California, she carried on the plane on her lap. So it's a big one. Would you would you want some of that? He said, Oh yeah. He said, Linda's going to bring me up some of that. I said, Okay. So Linda did take a nice big piece up there, <laughs> enough for three or four people, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that was it. And and uh, on the 13th, I was at the dentist, and Judy called me and said that Vernon had called her and asked for me. And I said, Well, what's wrong? She said, I don't know. He was telling me he need to talk to you. And I said, oh, okay, so I hung up and I called the uh, house. And Vernon got on the phone and, and I said, Mr. Press, I said, Sonny. He said, yeah, okay, Sonny, yeah, I, I've been, I was trying to get in touch with you. I said, yeah. Uh, Judy called me and told me, I said, is anything wrong? Because immediately I'm thinking something's wrong with Elvis. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, Elvis is out there at the house. I did not know he was already left and gone out to Palm Springs. And that's when he told me, he said, well, he said, yeah, he said, I, I need to talk to you. I was wondering if you could stop by here. I need to tell you something. Uh, if you could stop by when you leave. I said, well, well no way, Mr. Presley. I said, please don't leave it at that. I said, you know, uh, I, I could hear it. I'd like to hear it now. And he said, well, I'd rather tell you in person. I said, Mr. Presley, please. Now I'm really getting concerned. Right. And he said, well, he said, okay. He said, uh, uh, due to cost and everything, we're, we're going to have to cut back on expenses, you know. So I'm thinking immediately, pay cut. I said, well, okay, so what does that mean? He said, well, we're, we're going to have to let some people go. And I knew then. Oh, Jesus. And I said, and, I, and I'm one of those people, right? He said, well, yes, yes, you are. He said, but there's others. I said, well, who else? He said, I, I'd rather not say, I'd rather tell them each personally. Uh, I said, okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Presley. Wow, you were, you were nice to him. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I'll see you. Uh, okay, thanks. Bye-bye. And I hung up. I was wow. shocked. Wow. Dr. Altman finished working on me. I went back and told Judy she cried. Why? And I said, I don't know why. So I found out that Elvis was gone, so I called out there to Palm Springs. And one of the guys, I don't, I swear I can't remember who answered it, because I was still in a kind of a state of shock. And uh, I asked if Elvis was up yet. And they said, no. I said, okay. I said, uh, I'll try back either later or tomorrow. Well, the next day I called back, and the number had been changed. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so I thought, well, okay. 
So we're making plans to leave. So Dave leaves to go out there, and he stops off in Vegas, and he goes out to Dr. Ganim's house. That's where Elvis was. He had left Palm Springs because we knew he was there. And uh, see, he didn't want a confrontation with us, not, not, not physically thinking we would do something. But he didn't want us in front of him asking him why. Right, right. Have to tell this or that. He didn't want that. So he kept ducking you. Yeah. So he went over to Ganim's where he had the privacy of a gate-guarded community over there that Dr. Ganim had, and he had his own room there at Ganim. I don't know if it's his own room or if it's just a room that uh, Ganim uh, used and let Elvis use when he was there. I'm, I'm never was sure on I just know that it was upstairs. Mm -hmm. and it was a, like a master bedroom up there. So <clears throat> Dave found out, so he topped off, went over there to Ganim's, and the guard knew him. He knew us at work, fellas, and uh, he went on in up to the door, and they opened, and he said, hey, guys, how y'all doing? And just kind of walked on in. No one was going to stop him. Who's going to stop him? Seventh degree black belt, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> he talked to him a little bit, and they told me that was, he said, well, I just want to come by, and if he was up, I was going to say so long and how much I enjoyed the time that I was with him and everything, so you guys can go ahead and tell him that. And uh, I'll just go ahead and leave. I'm on my way back home to California. And they said, oh, okay, they were glad to see him go. He could feel the relief, you know. Mm -hmm. So he left, and he went and called me and said, Sonny, he's at Dr. Ganim's. I just left there. He said, the guy's acted weird, man. I said, oh, Dave, one thing, you haven't been around enough to know yet that when you're out, you're out. Everyone's against you in the group. Really? Oh, yeah. So I went ahead, except one time. That's when Elvis hit me for no reason. And then uh, no one was against me at that time. And he, he, he was sorry he did it, too. It was, an, it was just an accident, or he just got no, pissed? No, no purpose. We got into an argument. I'll tell you that in a minute. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he, uh, I called. Dr. Ganim answered the phone. And I said, Elias, how are you? He says, oh, who's that? I said, Sonny. He said, hey, Sonny. I said, uh, how are you doing? He said, pretty good. I said, look, I know that Elvis is there. Is he up yet? He said, oh, yeah, he just got through eating. I said, oh, okay, would well, you go ask me? Just tell me, I just call, I just need to. I talked to him for a second, you know, asked him something. He said, uh, yeah. He put the phone down and went up. But came back a couple of minutes later and said, uh, so he said that he, he doesn't want to talk to you right now. And I said, okay. I said, well, uh, last he may be thinking that I'm going to ask my job back, which I'm not calling to do. I said, I just, his dad told me it was a cutback on expenses. I know that's not true. Uh, not where Red and I are concerned today, the security, his main security force. So I, so I know that that's one thing that Elvis would not cut back on. Uh, he may cut back on some of those delays or whatever, but mm -hmm. not us. So there's another reason I just wanted to ask him. Tell him I'm not asking my job back. I just want to know he can tell me in one sentence one re the reason that I was let go, fired. Mm -hmm. He said, okay. So I said, in fact, Elias, he'll tell you to tell me. That would be fine. You can tell me. He said, okay. So he left. He came back and said, he doesn't want to discuss it. Jesus. Okay. I said, would you do me a favor? He said, sure. Because Elias and I, you know, got along fine. I said, just tell him that I, I said goodbye and I won't be calling back. He said, okay. Hmm. Bye-bye. And I hung up. That was it. That was it. That was it. I was done. And then I found out later from Linda Thompson <clears throat> the, that uh, Elvis had told his dad to give us uh, enough money to live on for a couple of months and the figure was like $5,000 or something. Mm -hmm. He said not just a couple, he said for two or three months and uh, that he was uh, going to hire Red and I back but he felt that he had become a money figure to Dave, and I don't know where he got that from. Dave didn't look at him as a money figure. Out. Dave loved it. I, you know, he did. He wasn't around as long as we did, but he loved it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, instead of him doing that, he gave us three days' notice and one week's pay. Jesus. That's it. Wow. That's it. And, and you never really knew. No. So I still don't know the real reason why. I don't know if it was a combination of all of them. Mm -hmm. I did hear someone said, well, if, if you're going to fire Red, you better go ahead and fire Sonny because you might have problems with him over, over Red being mm -hmm. gone or something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still, I really believe with all my heart that it was us confronting him over and over about his... Really? Uh, the, the drugs. I really, I will go 
to my grave doing that because no one can tell me the difference except Elvis. Mm -hmm. Elvis would have to tell me, this is why I fired you, Sonny. It was a combination of this. You, were, you and Red were talking about this and then the damn lawsuits or the this or that. I would, I would, uh, that's who I would accept from because he's the only one that knows. You know, I wouldn't even believe, if Bernie was alive, mm -hmm. I wouldn't even believe him. Really? Yeah, I know what he, what he's like. He's a well Elvis warned you to do because he wouldn't tell us that about the, the drugs. He wouldn't tell us about us being in Elvis's face. He'd say probably just the lawsuits or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I just believe that that's the real reason why. And then, of course, people said we did it for the money. And, you know, we were offered to come up with a figure not to do the book. Right. But that would have been a buyout, Joe, just like the doctors were being bought off. Mm -hmm. He'd buy them a new Cadillac. They gave me anything he wanted. So that was going to put us in the same category. Our jobs were important to us, and we loved them, but we loved him more, and we took our shot at just staying at him to, to stop what he was doing. Because there at the end, when he was insulting Kathy Westmoreland in the suites, that was not Elvis. Right. That was the stuff he was on that was making him do that. He was becoming uh, a colder, more angry person or something. I don't know what he was doing, because he was, you know, steroids would make you mean. That, uh, what's that one thing that you take, uh, cortisone? Mm -hmm. Will make you mean. Mm -hmm. He's taking cortisone stuff for his throat. And was he sick? Was he sick, or do you think it was prescription drugs that was making him sick? I think that prescription drugs, uh, the number of downers that he was taking, definitely lowers your metabolism and everything doesn't work like it should because it, those drugs work on your nervous system. They're not like a hypnotic sleeping pill that works on just your mind. Mm -hmm. These things numb, I mean, they, 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 they take away feelings in nerves and, and, and things in your body. And nerves, of course, run through everything you've got. Mm -hmm. They run through your kidneys, through your liver. There's nerves everywhere in your body. Mm -hmm. And so I really think that that contributed a whole lot mm -hmm. to his decline is, uh, in, his, in health. That had a tremendous lot to do with it. Because look at poor Howard Hughes, the same thing. Look how he wasted away. He was staying out of it on a lot of that. We heard he was taking, like, heroin and stuff. Really? Oh, yeah, that he was shooting stuff and that he was just in such pitiful shape. Mm. Um, what did I mean? Oh, uh, you were going to tell me about the day he slapped you or hit you? Uh, oh, no, I didn't slap. He hit me. He all off tried to punch me out. About what year was this? It was in 1961. Oh, that was early. Right after we come back from Hawaii, mm -hmm. we were uh, <clears throat> shooting the interiors in the sound stage there at Paramount. You know, we shot the location stuff over there, but the interiors of the clubs and the, the office that he worked at, the travel agency, all that stuff were, were sets on the sound stage there in, uh, in Hollywood at Paramount. So we had just come back about a week or so, and we had two or three weeks of shooting there. And... Uh, Tuesday well, he had been seeing her since a while in the country, and so she uh, came up to the house, and she brought a girl named Kay <clears throat> with her that was a nurse, very attractive woman, uh, and so I started talking to her at the wet bar that was in the den there, and we're sitting on the stool talking, and <clears throat> Tuesday at that time was young, and she drank a little bit, she even got sillier, you know, mm -hmm. made her silly. Elvis, in order to cope with that, he would uh, have a couple of drinks, too, so he could, he'd be silly with her, you know what I mean? Because he didn't handle his, his alcohol very good either, Joe. Yeah. The Smith side of him didn't handle it very well. But uh, it uh, sometimes did other things to him. So on his way to his room to use the bathroom or something, he stopped over by the bar, which was close to the door that goes to his bedroom, and uh, he leaned in between us and uh, said, Damn, you're cute. And he gave her a little peck. And she kind of flushed, and he, he grinned, and he walked on and went into his room. And she kind of flushed up a little bit and said, Hmm. <laughs> I said, Yeah, all right. So we started talking again. Well, a little bit later, he came back over there. And this time he leaned in, and he started really laying a big kiss on her mouth. And those arms of hers come up around his back and neck, and I'm sitting there with his back to, oh, that's it, it's done. So I eased off the counter, 
stool, I mean, the stool there at the bar, and I went over and first stopped off at Allen on Tuesday, and she's just giggling. She's watching at Allen and said, wow, man, shot down. I said, yeah. You know, and I went on over to Gene Smith, that was his cousin over on the couch, and uh, sat down next to him, and uh, Ella's kissing that girl over there still. And Gene does that grin when I sit down next to him. He said, burnt. That was one of our statements that we used to say then. Mm-hmm. And I said, to a Chris, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I leaned over to him quietly because I didn't want the girl sitting next to him to hear, and I didn't want uh, Tuesday anybody else to hear. And I said, Gene, if you had your choice between Tuesday and that girl, man, which one would you take? He said, Tuesday. I said, me too. God, <laughs> And that was it. And all of a sudden, Elvis, all the way from across the room, what did you just say, Sonny? And I said, oh, nothing. I just I just asked Gene something, I saw. You know, I didn't know where he was going with this at first. He said, I want to know what you said. You said something about me. I want to know what you said. I said, I didn't say anything about you. He said, yes, you did. And he started. And all of a sudden, I'd had enough. I stood up because Elvis said, you're going to tell me? I'm going to break this bottle over your head. It was a Coke or Pepsi, I think it was Pepsi bottle. And uh, that was it. I stood up and I said, you're not going to break any bottle over my head. I said, you can stop OSOB. Mm-hmm. You've changed so much in this year, I can't believe it. I don't like you, man. I don't even want to be around you anymore, Elvis. you changed. And I'll tell you certain things, Joe, in a minute about what I'm indicating there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, I quit. I'm, I, I'm leaving. You can't quit. You're fired. I said, whatever, whatever. I'm out of here. And I started walking. He All of a sudden, the bottle wasn't in his hand when he confronted me. He got around in front of me to stop me from being able to leave the room. And he starts hollering again. And I don't know exactly what he said. And, and all of a sudden, uh, I'm hollering back at him. And I, he hauled off and hit me right in the jaw. Mm-hmm. Spun my head to the side, and I turned back around. I looked at him. Was it a good hit? Oh, yeah. But I, I, I'm not bragging. I take a punch, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just turned back and looked at him, and uh, tears came out. And I said, I never thought you could do that. Oh, you didn't hit him back? Oh, no. No, no. How? How am I going to do that? Yeah, right. I walked. I turned around and walked away. Tuesday and Alan followed me in there, and Tuesday's crying. She said, what is wrong with him? Why did he hit you? And I said, because he's drinking, Tuesday. He's drinking. He doesn't drink. Well, she said, well, he shouldn't drink if that's what he turns into. And so we're talking. I just start getting some of my clothes out in a suitcase and start putting some things in it. And Alan said, I can't believe he did that, Sonny. I said, well, when he's drinking like that, Lamar, I, uh, Alan, you know. You know what he's like, man. Half of them got Smith blood in him that likes to fight and be badass when he drinks, I guess. Mm-hmm. So uh, all of a sudden, he's at the door, and he asks Tuesday and Alan to excuse him. He shuts the door and sits down and says, What's going on? I said, well, I'm just getting my stuff together. I've called a friend. I'm, I'm going over to her place for a couple of days and just figure out done some things. He said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know yet. He said, uh, have you got any money? I said, yeah, I got, I got some money. I'm okay. He said, well, you want one of the guys to, to take you some places? I said, no, I got, a, I got a cab coming. Thanks. He said, well, what's wrong? I said, well, I just don't understand what just happened. I was, I'm a little shocked by it. And I said, you've changed some man in this year. And it's kind of caught me off guard. You know, I hadn't changed. I guess you have, Elder. I guess you have. So, I, small talk, and I just said to him, I said, is it all right if I leave most of my clothes here and come back up and get them so I don't have to take them tonight? And he said, yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe he thought that when I came back, I wouldn't be needing to move him, you know. But anyway, I left. He walked to the door and watched me get in the cab and leave. Mm-hmm. And I left it. And then he, I guess, shut the door and went on back in there. <clears throat> and then about nine days later, I walked over to the lot on Paramount. And the guard knew me. And I asked him what sound stage they were on. And he told me. And I went to it. And the guys were standing around there talking. I went over to them, Alan and, and Gene and them. And they were... Like I said, usually when you were out with Elvis, you were out with the guys, too. Mm-hmm. But in this case, they knew I hadn't done a thing wrong or he was totally wrong. And I don't know what he had been saying between that eight days ago and today about, you know, I, I shouldn't have hit him or something. You know, I thought he said something about me. So mm-hmm. 
maybe he didn't indicate that they should be against me, that I was out, and maybe that's why, but at least they weren't. We stand there talking, then he walks off of the set after shooting a scene and uh, saw me in kind of a half shift in his step there for a little polish at sunny. I said, hey, Ellis, he says, come on in here, man. And I, I went over to the portable dressing room, and Joe was sitting there reading one of the trade papers. I don't know which one, Variety or, or the mm -hmm. reporter, Hollywood trade papers. And, and uh, Joe said, Elvis said, Joe, excuse us, Miss Man, I want to talk to Sonny. And Joe said, oh, yeah. He said, hey, son, I said, hey, Joe. And he walked away, and I sat down on the couch in the dressing room and was watching him. He sat down at the makeup table there where he did his hair and had his makeup and everything put on and started brushing his hair a little bit. And uh, I'm watching through the mirror at his image there. It's, all of a sudden, our eyes locked in the mirror there. He saw me, and I saw him. That man came to his face. And he said, you crazy son of a bitch. <laughs> I said, me? I'm not crazy. Joe, you there? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I was so listening to it. Oh, <laughs> so uh, I went ahead, and, and he, uh, uh, we kind of laughed about it and everything. He said, what are you going to do? I said, well, what I'd like to do... That was, I'd like to stay out here and get in the screen extra skills mm -hmm. and work like Red does out here and then work with you when you come out on your pictures and stuff. And they said if I get a letter from you that I can get in immediately because they have a waiting list. People want to get in. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, I was the type of people that worked in his movies, young people. So he always had a lot of them on his pictures. So he employed a lot mm -hmm. to show his movies did. So that wasn't a problem. Well, the other guys found out and... They all wanted to join, too, and make extra money. Because the way the contract was then, if you were over either 75 or 150 miles away from, from Hollywood, mm -hmm. you could work people uh, extra without have them having to belong to the union. Mm -hmm. But if you were within that radius, you had to hire u union people. So uh, we got in, and sure enough, they went back and made follow that dream. When they came out, I went over there at uh, Goldwyn Studios and hung out with them over there. Then they went back home and they came back out and the next picture was, I think, uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, something, uh, Kid Galahad or something. Oh, another. <laughs> I, I liked that picture. Did you? Yeah, I did. I liked Kid Galahad. I liked, uh, what's his name? His acting between Charles Bronson and Gig Young and Elvis. I thought that was a great. Yeah, movie. I like Gig Young and I like uh, Bronson, so. Did he ever, maybe I missed it, did he ever say he was sorry to you? No. It just heard, went on. I never heard. I never heard uh, him say that uh, to anybody that he was wrong and that he was sorry. You he just went on. Or he bought you a car. Or he did something, but he just couldn't come out and say. Uh, and, and the perfect time that he could have done that was because when I went in there with Alan and Tuesday, mm -hmm. he stepped over to Gene and said, "Gene, what did he say? What did he say about me?" And, uh, and Gene said, "Oh, he didn't say anything about you." He said, "What did he say then?" And Gene didn't want to say it out loud in front of that girl. Oh, mm -hmm. tomorrow, of course, Tuesday was in there with me, but uh, and Alan, she had followed us over there, me over there. So he said, he just asked me if I had a choice to be with Tuesday or that girl, which one I would be with. And I told him Tuesday, and he said, him too. And then he said, we just laughed about it, and that was it. And he yelled out at him. He said, he didn't say anything else? He didn't say anything about me? But that girl? He said, no, Elvis, I promise you he didn't. So... When he came to that room after learning that, Joe, that was the perfect time when right. he had Alan and, and Tuesday leave. That would have been the most appropriate time mm -hmm. right then to say, Sonny, I'm sorry, man, I shouldn't have hit you. Yeah, but he never did. Never did. Did he buy you a car no, or something? If he said that at that time, I wouldn't have gone anywhere that night. Mm -hmm. If he had said that, I'd have said, I know that was, I, it was that, that gum food, man, and we'd have laughed at it. And he said, well, maybe that's why I don't drink so much because, you know. I don't know what else would have been said. I can just surmise. But if he had apologized, said he was wrong, and that he was sorry that he did it, mm -hmm. I would not have left. But he, could, he couldn't do it. He could not even say he was wrong, much less I'm sorry. Was he always like that? Maybe I shouldn't have hit you. Yeah, I mean, he didn't do anything in that area. So mm -hmm. that, what was I going to do then? Mm -hmm. What would you ask? Would, he would never say sorry to people? I mean, he never I heard him say uh, yeah, I've heard him. I've heard him talk around it in ways. Uh, mm. Maybe I shouldn't have done this or right. that. I thought, you know, something like that. I'm saying, so I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. Was there like special rules? I mean, yeah. Elvis was always right. I mean, mm-hmm. Really? So, but he, and he usually was. Elvis always got the girl. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, they, I knew better than to think they were there to see me originally. Uh -huh. I, I, if I showed them a personality and, and they had fun and they, they all of a sudden they think, man, I really like Sonny. That's the way it worked, you know. But if it didn't, they didn't. 